what I'm here to talk today about is, is kind of give you an overview in the present state of sea level rise, what we know about it, a little bit on the past because you can't talk about sea level rise only in the context of the future, and then talk about storm surge. And these are two processes that are intrinsically related but completely different. Right? One is resulting from storms, the other is a relatively slow long-term change in water level. But they are related, and we'll try to segue into that right in the middle. Uh, as I mentioned, I came out of URI in, in April. I'm uh, currently in Eastern Connecticut State, uh, and a lot of this work is done in collaboration with my uh, my former advisor, my now colleague, John Boothroyd, who uh, couldn't be here today, otherwise I probably would have pawned this off on him. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I still live in Rhode Island, so I like to stay down here as much as I can and not commute all the way to Willamantic, but I do have to run up there after my talk, so I can't hang around all afternoon. It's not a, a slight to the seminar. I just have to be in Connecticut this afternoon. So when we talk about sea level rise, there's really two components we need to think about. We need to think about eustatic sea level, which is global sea level rise. And in most projections, if you pick up a, a paper and it's written by Romsdorf or Vermeer, it's talking about eustatic, about global sea level. And that's a very important thing to consider, but we need to understand there's also relative sea level. With eustatic sea level, there's two real ways we can change it. We can warm up the water, which actually expands the water molecules, and warm water takes up more room than cold water or we can add water to the ocean. Of course, on geologic timescales, we can actually decrease sea level, but we're only going to focus on sea level rise today. Thermal expansion is pretty straightforward. When you see projections of future sea level rise, this is the more well understood component. <coughs> temperature goes up, sea level goes up. And this is a great paper by Rob Storff et al. in 2007. It's hard to believe it's now five years old. And he took a very semi-empirical, very almost qualitative, but not quite, there's a differential equation in there, look to say, look, when temperature goes up, sea level goes up. It's kind of like a Bloomberg headline, you know, it's climate change stupid, it kind of looks like that. It's warmer water, it's stupid. Right? That's only part of it, though. Right? We also have to add water to the ocean, or decrease it in the geologic past. How do we do that? I'm a, I'm a you know, professor, I teach, so I always do this with my students. How do we add water to the oceans? Melt glaciers. Melt. Yeah, you, add, you melt ice, right? Particularly, we're focusing on ice sheets, but mountain glaciers play a role as well. We know this works. In the past, this is uh, 26,000 years ago, you were at that red arrow. The Laurentide Ice Sheet extended across Long Island over Block Island, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and into the Gulf of Maine. At that time, the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the other uh, global ice sheets had a lot of water basically taken out of the ocean to make the ice sheet. There's only so many water molecules on Earth, so if you have a lot of ice sheets, you have less water in the oceans. The shoreline was actually way out here, which means all of this was dry land, and there's a woolly land. And so we can look at global sea level records and see this, that uh, 26,000 years ago, sea level was about 400 feet lower. That's pretty well understood. It's risen a number of, uh, it's since then, fairly flat over the last 5,000 years or so, except perhaps the uptick in 20th century climate change. What's really important on this figure, though, are these various jumps. Most notably, Meltwater Pulse 1A and 1B, although 1B is somewhat controversial right now, and even Meltwater Pulse 1C. There's a lot of different arguments for these. The important point on the Meltwater Pulses is they represent uncertainty in the behavior of ice sheets. This represents probably rapid drawdowns, meaning rapid melting and retreat of, best science right now suggests, the Antarctic and the Laurentide ice sheets for 1A and 1B. And these result in several meters of sea level change within maybe a century or so. Maybe as little as a few decades, but getting that kind of resolution is difficult. So let's be conservative and say two meters in a century, but it could be even higher than that. Well, why is that important? Well, understanding future sea level rise really hinges on understanding ice sheets, particularly Greenland. And this is a very famous photo that now, again, it's hard to believe this is 10 years old. This is taken on the Greenland ice sheet. This is meltwater going down a moulin, which is a crevasse that reaches the bottom of an ice sheet, which can then actually speed up the flow of the ice sheet and cause the outlet glaciers in particular to flow faster. There's a whole glaciologic thing in here. I'm actually a, a coastal and a glacial geologist, and we could talk about outlet glaciers for uh, the rest of the morning, but for now, we'll just know this adds water to the ocean. This actually just published today in Science, and I couldn't get on my laptop my Science subscription through the library, so the figure is a little poor quality. You have time here from 1992 up till 2011. This is published by Andrew Shepard and his colleagues. He's a uh, 
sea level glaciologist from uh, England. And this shows the amount of sea level contribution over the 22 years of the Antarctic, the Greenland, and the combined. And what it suggests is these ice sheets have contributed about 11 millimeters, about 1.1 centimeters of sea level rise over the last 20 years or so. This is largely done with satellite data, and we'll look at satellite data in a second with sea level. Uh, the important component here is Greenland is about two-thirds of it. And a lot of the uncertainty and uh, contribution is probably going to come out of Greenland with some meltwater uh, contributed from the Antarctic as well. We can also have relative sea level rise, though. A relative sea level rise or fall is the actual number you measure at your favorite particular spot. So you go to the Newport tide gauge, you look up the relative sea level trend. And that takes into account all of the different factors. Most commonly, it's some kind of elevation change in the land surface. If you're in Sitka, Alaska, this is plate tectonics uplift of the land surface. If you're in the glaciated northeast, it might be isostat, meaning unloading and loading after the retreat of the last ice sheet. We're not going to talk about this right now. It turns out, tectonically, we're pretty stable. We're on a passive continental margin, meaning we're not being subducted. There's no active transform. It's pretty, pretty mellow here tectonically. Isostatically, you think, well, we got covered by this big ice sheet, and that did have an impact on us. We were depressed in Providence at the last maximum, probably about 100 meters or so, maybe a little more, and there's probably about 1,000 feet of ice over our heads. But by this time, 20,000 years later, it's really not a big player. Uh, we don't think, at least not in southern New England. Go to Hudson Bay, Canada, it's a very big deal. And you're actually lifting up there at about a centimeter per year. What we do want to think about, though, is changes in circulation pattern within the ocean. Everybody thinks sea level is flat. Turns out sea level actually has some topography to it. It's a little higher relative to other spots within the ocean, largely driven by circulation and wind patterns. And so this came to uh, everybody's forefront in the media uh, and science in June and July of this year, a uh, paper by Abby Salinger. Abby is a USGS coastal geologist, a very well-respected geologist. And he published a paper with some colleagues. Uh, he's not the first. I actually got the numbers from a couple of other papers. But the figure comes out of Abby's work that suggests that north of Cape Hatteras, in southern New England and the mid-Atlantic, we could be seeing an increase in the rate of relative sea level rise, driven by changes in Gulf Stream circulation. The Gulf Stream's way out here. And basically, if that slows down, a slightly higher sea level at the Gulf Stream relative to our coastline is going to kind of come back into balance. Okay. Abby's a good scientist, and as the first speaker mentioned, you have to caveat all of this. That could be, could be a big increase, a foot or more by 2100. The could part of this is we're only working with about a 100-year record at most on most tide gauges. New York City's more than 100 years. Newport, we're only at about 80 years. So if this is just some kind of multi-decadal cycle, 30 or 40 year cycle, trying to get that out of an 80 year record and say this is going to be the trend for the next 100 years is very difficult to do. So it's something we should consider, but you know, you got to caveat the, the hell out of all of this stuff. That's a very important, important thing to do. Now, the worst thing we could do as scientists is, is run around with chicken little. Right, we need to say here are the facts, here's the honest uncertainty, and here are the, are the possibilities, but not you know, always talk worst case scenario. So what does this all lead to? What's your static sea level rise today? Okay. This is taken by the satellites, Jason and uh, Topex, uh, Jason 1 and 2, and downloaded on, I don't know, a couple days ago from the University of Colorado who oversees this. The satellite record goes back to about 1992, and you see a seasonal trend in here, but if you take uh, a smooth record, you see a pretty good increase of, I'll make it a little bigger, 3.1 millimeters per year. That's a third of a centimeter per year. If you're not comfortable thinking about something that small, think about a foot per 100 years, 31 centimeters per century. That doesn't sound like a big deal, right? If I live to be 120-ish, okay, sea level is going to go up a foot if you follow this trend. But the big question, of course, would it stay linear? And the answer is probably not. Right? Even that one foot of sea level rise would have an impact, but when we start thinking about storm surge, uh, exponential changes in sea level become very important. How does that compare locally? Uh, this is a figure that if you're from Rhode Island, you've seen before. This is one John compiled uh, from the Newport Tide Gauge. And he has a very similar looking record. This is the water level record smoothed. Uh, and then this is the average trend. 
Over the entire record from 1931 to 2009, when this figure was last updated, or at least the version I have was last updated, uh, you see about 25.6 centimeters per century, about the same as, as Romsdorf and, and the satellite projection would say. If you focus just on the last uh, 20 years or so, the satellite record, uh, we're just slightly higher than that, 36 centimeters per century. Okay? Given the plus or minus, we're really in the same neighborhood. What does that suggest? That there may be this relative change due to circulation, something we should definitely consider in the future, but not guarantee. And isostatic and tectonically is probably pretty, pretty small. We're at about the same rate of eustatic sea level rise, again, barring that, that change in circulation. But that's not what everybody wants to know. Most of you guys don't want to write about what sea level rise is doing today. Everybody wants to know what it can do in the future. And as was discussed, you, we don't have time machines. I can't fly to 2100 and go look at the Newport Titan Age. What we can do is look at past observations and couple that with models. The advantage now the modelers have, and I'm not a modeler, so I'm speaking to other people's work here, is the models, a lot of them were done as far back as the early 80s. A lot of good models began to be done in the 90s. So now we have 20 years of data to compare to the models. And that's a very important thing to do. You can kind of tune your models, see which models are working and which ones are not and then see which ones you might trust moving forward. Again, we can't travel forward in time. It's the best we can do. Okay. This is the current projection from, uh, well, slightly current projection from Vermeer and Romstorf. And what you see here, this is based on temperature records from the IPCC. This is not the IPCC 2007 sea level scenario. They would have had it capped out down here because they didn't want to talk about land ice. That's a whole other story. They basically ripped out. Romsdorf and Vermeer basically took their temperature reconstructions from the IPCC and came up with sea level scenarios of 75, so two and a half feet, to almost six feet of sea level rise by 2100. A lot of this is thermal expansion, but even more is, is contributions from the ice sheets. One of the things you can do, and again this just published two days ago, is look at models and your observations. And I'm trying to remember which one is which. I think red is satellite, orange is tide gauge. Yeah, it must be because of the time frame. And then these are the different climate projections. And one of the kind of scary parts of this is that the sea level data seems to fit always on the upper part of these sea level reconstructions. So when you start looking at 75 to 150 or even 200 centimeters, the projections seem to be on more on the 120 to 150 range. So four to five feet of sea level rise by 2100 right now would be a pretty good estimate for your stat. Okay. Locally, what does that look like? <clears throat> this is that same tide gauge figure over here, extrapolated out. If you follow the trend here, you come out to about here. This is the IPCC 2001. It was the better of the two IPCCs because it took into account ice. And this is that high range for Vermeer and Romstein. The way up here, as Al Gore would say, off the chart or off the screen. All that's well and good. A lot of what you're going to hear about today is adapting to sea level rise. Sea level rise is probably an adaptable thing if we start planning for it now. And you'll hear a lot about this today with some of the towns, what they're doing. This is a small community. I've heard a lot of the talks that the other people are going to give today uh, or variations of it. And again, if I live to be a normal age, and let's even go above and beyond and say I live to be 100, even at that high rate of sea level rise, we're talking about a meter in my lifetime. That's adaptable. What's not adaptable is storm surge. Storm surge, the way to think about it, is an instantaneous rise in relative sea level. If you want to see what five feet of sea level rise looks like, you look at Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was five feet, 5.3 feet at the Newport tide gauge of storm surge. There's your instantaneous rise at sea level with surge on top of it. If you're not familiar, that's the Narragansett Pier seawall. Here's the piece that fell in. And this is the condo complex across the street. There's a cop car going down uh, Ocean Road. How high will the water actually be? Well, for perspective, that's Hurricane Sandy, about five feet above mean higher high water. Up there is 1938. So one of the things that was happening after Sandy was we were walking around the coastline, and people would say, oh, this is so amazing. It's like, no, this is not. This is exactly what you expect from a Category 1 hurricane. I mean, we had five feet of storm surge. We had 15-foot waves in Block Island Sound. It's what you expect. This is going to be a whole lot worse, and it will happen again. What are some of the implications, though? Okay. When we're thinking about this on our human time scales, probably the biggest caveat I put on this is 
Sea level rise does not cause the coastal erosion. It's storms that are driving the shoreline change. And I'm not going to even speak about more storms or less storms and climate change. To me, that's a moot point right now. Storm surge is the, is the issue. We have storms now. It's not like they're going to be a new component of climate change. How to think of this? Sea level rise is about a third of a centimeter right now. At high end projections, we'd be talking a centimeter or so per year. Storm surge plus waves on the south shore of New England is 15 feet right, during a significant landfall in Hurricane. So it's the storms that are really causing this. Right? What it does, though, what sea level rise does, is allow those storms to act further on the shoreline and move further inland. And it allows smaller, more frequent storms to have a bigger impact. What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at this chart, this is actually taken out of Rachel Harris' uh, master's thesis uh, done with John. This is storms in blue is extratropical red or hurricanes, surge in Providence, surge in Newport. There is a slightly higher surge for most storms in Providence than Newport. Water gets funneled up there against it back. Sandy falls about there. A little bit above Hurricane Bob, well below Hurricane Carol, well below 1938. But when we start thinking about sea level rise, that's Hurricane Sandy with three feet of sea level rise. We're now eclipsing Carol at six feet of sea level rise. The Romsdorf really high in projection. We're now well above the 1938 hurricane. If we're adapting and everything's moving up at the same rate of sea level rise, this isn't a big deal. We have the same impact of Sandy we had in 2012 in 2075. <coughs> Excuse me. If your infrastructure is not moving, right, Sandy now has the impact larger than Hurricane Carol. Right. If it doesn't move by 2100 and we really have that high rate of sea level rise, your impacts of a small storm like Sandy are going to be more than that of the 19th. So storm surge is a completely different process than sea level rise, but they are intrinsically related in that way. What does storm surge do? Well, it's a very natural process. The natural response of the shoreline is to deposit sediment landward and actually migrate landward and upward. This is uh, Atlantic Avenue Wall, Squamacan, and here are the nice washover fans deposited by overwash all the way down to the road there. Natural response. What's the problem? Nobody likes the natural response to the shoreline <laughs> because they want to row. Hey, oh, I've got to get into my driveway. So it turns out removal is a bad idea. This is a concept that John's been probably talking about for 30 years and I'll talk about for 30 more. Okay. Removal of this is a bad idea. The, the natural response would be to let the barriers retreat landward and upward. Win this by a war of attrition. If houses go away, sediment moves from the front of the beach to the back, leave it alone. Again, people don't like doing that because there are businesses here, there are roads here, and so the battle is going to be to try to find a way to allow this to happen but not negatively impact the businesses and the homes down here. I think the balance can be found, uh, but I'm maybe overly optimistic because I'm near the beginning of my career and I'll get more cynical by the end. Okay. The other thing this does is impact structures that aren't being elevated. And this is a, a picture that shows uh, our long-term beach profile monitoring station in Charlestown. We basically measure the shoreline here weekly, uh, and we have been doing it since the late 70s. For the record, all of this 40 went away during Hurricane Sandy, and the ramp, the slope of the profile where the water was, was back about here. Right? This picture was taken after the Patriot State storm in 2007. Again, storm surge and sea level rise are not the same process, but they are related. That's the 100-year. It's really the 1930 hurricane, even though FEMA's not calling that our 100-year storm anymore. That's just silly statistics. Mark Twain will tell you there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> if we factor in four feet of sea level rise, that's where the wave envelope now is. That means that's where the top of the waves would be on that shoreline. What we learned from Gulf hurricanes, if your first floor joist, hey, I'm losing my thing here, sunshine. If that floor joist is uh, impacted by breaking waves, your house has a pretty high chance of not being there the next day. So this would be catastrophic loss. This is borderline survival right now. And with that, I found that on South Kingston Town Beach on the washover fan, which also happens to be on the leach field. And again, this is the problem. People want the sand in the home. This is the sand's home. This is where it wants to be after a storm. And I'll take any questions if there's time. If not, you can always uh, ping me later and uh, we can chat. There's time for questions.